week, we began a series in this well-known song. We'll recap. This song is well-known, both to the Christian and to the unbelieving world. As mentioned last week, this, this song is one that many could quote. I hope you can. Many would even recite. I hope you do. This song is certainly familiar, and we dare say, and should say, rightly so. It is familiar. But I ask of you again, ask of myself, ask us as a church, as families, as Christians, is it possible that we are over familiar with it? And what I mean is this, have we ever stopped to consider what this psalm is saying to us as believers? Have we ever stopped to consider that? Or have we been guilty of just reading on with assumption that this song is just well known. It's well known enough to us. We, we don't need to focus on that one. It's, it's all over the place. Friends, I honestly do think it's possible that we have become over familiar with it. And this is the very reason this morning and the weeks ahead I want us to spend the time on this great prayer. I quote last week and I quote again a man named John B. He said this, hear these words. Psalm 23 is, deep, is a deeply spiritual meditation. It is a jewel unsurpassed in riches and in beauty. When properly applied, Psalm 23 reveals the highest, deepest, widest, and most glorious experience into which God leads his people this side of heaven. Again, I quoted from a famous preacher named F. B. Mayer, and he said this of this old psalm. Again, I ask you to hear carefully the sweetness of this quote. Mayer says this, This is my creed. I need, I desire no other. I learned it from my mother's lips. I have repeated it every morning I awoke for the last 20 years. Yet I do not half understand it. I am only beginning to spell out it, its infinite meaning. And death will come on me with task unfinished. But by the grace of Jesus, I will hold on to this song as my creed. And I will strive to believe and to live it. For I know that it will lead me to the cross and guide me to glory. This, friends, this psalm, as the title tells us, is a psalm of David. Many commentators agree that this would have been one of David's, David's earliest compositions. The language is, isn't it, certainly that of David, as he was once a shepherd. The theme of the psalm shows us that the writer is one who has intimacy with God as shepherd. And also, I, see, I think we clearly see that this writer, David, is one who has known enemies on every side. Death has been near many times. But deliverance, friends, has been David's constant report. Again, we can say with Beak that this psalm, this famous Psalm 23, has David's autograph all the way through. Again, for recapping, we ask two things. Who is this shepherd? Noting that the role of the shepherd is very thematic throughout the whole of Scripture. We cite a varying scriptures. It is Yahweh, the great shepherd, the living one, the self-existent one. Father, Son, and Spirit. We very much touched on that at our Bible study. 
This is Yahweh God, the shepherd. Yet especially here, the shepherd is the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. I am the good shepherd, said Christ. The second thing we ask is, what has this shepherd done? This Lord who is our shepherd, what has he done? Again, we break that into two separate quotes. The first one, that the shepherd gathers his flock. I think that is wonderful, I think it is beautiful, and it is necessary that we make note of it. The shepherd gathers his flock. He does this by becoming, as we said last week, a curse to them. Christ came and died a substitutionary death. Who? For his flock. That's what he did, isn't it? Died the death of a sinner, becoming the propitiation for his people. And again, we quote the shepherd himself I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We went on, didn't we? The shepherd preserves his people. The redemptive work of Christ saves his flock. And the, one, the ones who redeems, he keeps them. This is the very theme of the psalm. This is why we must be reminded of it. That this shepherd gathers in, and this shepherd nurtures, and this great shepherd himself, he keeps. He will hold you fast. He will, let, he will not let you wander. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's the nature of man. That's the nature of the believer. But he is the great shepherd. And he keeps his flock. Again, I quote only the one to whom I speak of, Christ the shepherd, who said this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Lovely language, isn't it? Lovely language to which the shepherd promises each and every one to whom he is saved. He promises eternal life. Now, it is ours, it is yours. That's just the first line of the song. Today we go on to what the song says, I shall not want. Still in the first verse there, so you can probably imagine how long we could be here. I shall not want. One thing we must know, friends, very quickly, and I'm sure and I hope that you're aware of this, that the Christian is not promised an easy life. It's not promised an easy life. In fact, we ought to say quite the opposite. John, Jesus, forgive me, says in John 16, in the world you will have tribulation. We also read in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, 21, 22, listen to this. When they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, so this is this, this gospel's having its effect. They returned to Lystra, Iconia, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. You see, we don't need to work too hard, do we? To find very much throughout the whole of Scripture, and in particular in the New Testament. That in the Christian life, we shall face trials, we shall face tribulations, and we shall have and experience sufferings. It's the Apostle Paul who reminds us in that great chapter of Romans 8, where he says the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. So while we are here, 
while we are planted in this place, which we call planet Earth, while we live our Christian life, yes, we have come from darkness into His glorious light. We, as His people, as His army, as saints of God, are promised trials, troubles, tribulations, and sufferings. And we ought to quickly know that. Again, it must be even already in my short time here that I've quoted on Pilate and he said this, I would not do this if it weren't true. I would not choose this. I would not live this life if it were not true. If Christ had not come in the fullness of glory, if he had not revealed himself, if he had not made himself flesh, why would I do this? Why would I walk this path if this were not true? Why would I wake up morning after morning with the battle of sin and against the flesh and the darts of the devil? Why would I do this if this were not true? We wouldn't, would we? Unless, of course, we are guilty of living out Dead religion. And let me make this clear to you, friends. Christianity is not a dead religion. It's not an emotion that we go through. It is a life of glory and it is a life of battle. To trials, troubles, tribulations, and sufferings are at the door. They are at the door. Another thing to know. This term, I shall not want, does not in any way advocate the heretical preaching of what is called the word of faith in the This claims as we declare that we have it. Riches and wealth are mine in Christ. Friends, this not only makes ridicule of the gospel, but it is cruel and it is a horrible outcome for so many poor souls. Therefore we're left with a question. What then does all this I shall not want mean? What does it mean when the psalmist, what does it mean when we as Christians say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's there, it's pen and ink, it's written. It is inspired by God, and it's, we ought to be able to deal with it. I shall not want. What does it mean? If the Christian life is a life of trial and tribulation, and if it's not a life of complete health and wealth and prosperity, then what? What does this mean? How can you and I say with confidence, I shall not want? Again, two headings. One, I shall not want in the temporal. And number two, I shall not want in the spiritual. That's how I'm going to continue with this this morning. I shall not lack in the temporal. In other words, I shall not lack here, here on earth. I will not lack. If you're a believer, if, if you can connect even this first line to the second line, the Lord is my shepherd. Now let's be careful that we don't disconnect, I shall not want, to that first statement. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There is one thing we must be clear on, even with the backdrop of the nonsense of the so-called prosperity gospel. We, we must never cease to forget that God provides all of our needs. Also be reminded that it is God, our shepherd, who gives according to his purpose. It is he who gives. He makes some rich and some poor. He opens the womb of some and shuts the womb of others. He grants long life to some and shorter to others. We could go on. He is the giver of all things. And we ought to be able to say, not with gritted teeth, but with joyful hearts, as the psalmist says in 115 verse 3, the Lord does as he pleases. The Lord does as he pleases. Job 1 21 says this, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return to thee. 
the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Psalm 75 verse 6 and 7 says this, For exhortation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one, and he exalts another. Friends, I encourage you this morning. Let us, let you and I, not be found guilty in grumbling and waving our fists at God, crying out, you are not giving good to me. But rather come with the psalmist and say, I will not lack any good thing. I present to you a plethora of scriptures. Psalm 31, 9, 4. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold for those who walk upright. Matthew 10, 29 through 31. Listen to this, friends. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. But the very hairs on your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more value, you have more value than many sparrows. Again, I go on, Philippians 4, verse 19. And my God shall supply all your needs according, listen to this, according to what? According to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. Do you know that our Father owns all things? Do you know that? And he gives as he pleases to whom he pleases. Beloved, we could go on and on with such texts. We see God is the one who graciously and kindly supplies all of our needs. It is that we must remember. This text in Psalm 21, to, uh, Psalm 23, verse 1, does not promise us all earthly wealth, though, friends, he can and does rightly give that to whom he pleases. But he does not promise his flock earthly riches. What he does promise them is all earthly necessities. That's what he does. Again, I quote from a good friend of mine, Mr. Spurgeon. I didn't know him personally, I'm not old enough to have. But he says this, I might want otherwise, but when the Lord is my shepherd, he is able to supply all of my needs. And he is certainly willing to do so. Do you hear that? I believe Mr. Spurgeon is once again correct. He is certainly willing to do so, for his heart is full, and therefore I shall not want. I ask you a question. Are you still guilty? of doubting the goodness of God. You still doubt the goodness of God. Are you here this morning? Are you sat there thinking that this all sounds okay? It's good in theory. But really, where is the reality of it? How can I say I shall not want? Again we go to the words of the shepherd himself, Matthew 6, 26, says this. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Remember, this is the words of the shepherd. He says this, Are you not worth more value than they? Again, maybe it's another one of those texts that we just fly past. It's not theological enough. It's not that high doctrine. Old friends, do not be mistaken. It really is. And you know what the Lord is saying to you this morning? Come now and walk with me. Come with me. Come. Come into the hills. Come and, come and look for a while with me. You see those birds? You see the worms and the butterflies? You see the great provision? That's what he's saying to you this morning. Do you see all of that? Do you see that the birds are fed morning and night? Do you see that the caterpillar is provided for? Do you see the, the grass in the fields that feed the sheep? Do you see his great provision for all of that? But he's saying to you this morning, are you not worth more than all of this? You are more value. And he will give you every need. Don't for a second deny it. And we can say that firstly by experience. And secondly, on the authority of his word. Blessed saints, truly, we ought to be a people who in the psalmist say, I shall not want. We could go on in all of the things we could go around and ask for great testimony of when in that moment God just did it, didn't he? He just provided it, just in time. We, we were reflected on, on, on how some of us met Julian and, and Rebecca. Just in that right moment, just on that day, just then, just at the flash of the pan, it all took place. In a moment. You see, this is the God who is the master of all. He is the sovereign one who does what he pleases. And he moves things according to the counsel of his own will. This is the God we serve, friends. Or are we not to forget it? Or are we not be guilty of such? I show on one point two in the spiritual. We have highly and rightly look to the great reality of the shepherd caring for our daily needs. That's what he does for who? He does that for his flock. Daily, in a moment, every hour, every second, caring for his flock, providing all that we need, food and clothing, and those daily necessities that we so often take advantage of. You can confidently say, can we not that he will not leave the righteous to beg for bread? But is that all this text refers to? And have we been guilty of thinking that it's all it refers to? Maybe. Maybe not. It cannot be, or can it? If we read the psalm aright, it cannot be. When we hear the whole of this psalm, the shepherd bringing all that is needed for the believer. Again, we allow the psalm to speak for itself. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. I only highlight a few. We'll highlight them all as we go on by working through the weeks. He restores my soul. That's far more than food and drink. I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Friends, again, we could get caught on that song and read it to you. But what we've got to realize is that this is not just talking about bread on our table or clothes on our back. It surely is that. But there's something higher, there's something wider, there is something deep, deeper. That this shepherd is the one who gives us all that we need. But so maybe, maybe our Christianity, maybe your walk this morning is only fixed on that which is temporal. Therefore, you can only recognize that which is temporal. 
Maybe you're so busy looking around, thinking how that business might be prosperous, or how I can get a better pay rise, or all the rest of them. Those things are real. And if you've heard me all right, you will not think that I'm trying to dismiss any of those great things that God gives us. But if we are only to look into that which is temporal, we are not looking wide enough, friends. Within this psalm, we see supply, we see rest, we see restoration, we see guidance, we see discipline, we see security. And that is only a handful. Are these not the very things that we shall not want? Think on this. As one of God's flock, firstly we can cry out aloud with joy in our hearts that we have full forgiveness and total power. We as God's sheep have been given redemption. We have been given redemption. And friends, that's why if I'm being honest with you and I seek to do that, then why we need to look at, in an evening at Isaiah 53 to look again at this wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Of how this did take place. That it's not some story over there on a hill somewhere, but actually it's a reality that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And we need to be reminded of it. And it gives us, this shepherd who died, he gives you full forgiveness, total pardon. You see, I don't know if you all realize yet that you have the white robe ready to be put upon you. That it is yours, that he shall give it to you. That he has said, I, today I give you eternal life. That you really have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's done. We as God's sheep have been given redemption, and now we are being sanctified, preserved. And friends, is this not what the apostle tells us in the again, that great chapter in Romans 8, 29, 28 through 39? Let me read it to you. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called these, he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Theologians call that the great golden chain. And I would ask you all to go and meditate upon just that verse and see the great provision of this great shepherd. Praise God for his faithfulness. He goes on. What then shall we say to these things? What things? The things Paul's just said. Those things. These things. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered them up for his own, how shall he not be with him also freely give us all things? Friends, listen to this. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sorrow? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Just to finish there, listen to this climatic end in Romans 8. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
He is the substance, friends. He is the object of our worship and He is the very substance of our eternal bliss. This is not language of lack, is it? Or is it? Is this language of lack? Are we need to walk around like wandering sheep with no hope. We have a Father in heaven who has saved us and nurtured us and keeps us. That's what we have. This is not language of lack. This is, not, this is language of fullness. This is language of assurance. You see it, don't you? I trust you do, dear beloved. No one is trying to say that you shall have an easy life or a life without a battle. Oh, you will, but you, my friends, if you are one of the flock, if you have been saved by grace, you can say this, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Do you see the vastness of this? We live with small minds, friends. We live so temporal, it is beyond me. The church of Jesus Christ, God's flock, has all the promises of His Word, and we, you and I, ought to stop living like we believe it. Neither death, nor life, nor neither principalities or powers. Should we go on? Should I repeat again? I think I ought. Nor things present. Those things now. Oh, he doesn't stop. Nor things to come. What's that? Oh, where death, where is thy sting? Where is it? No death. There's no sting in death for those who are in Christ Jesus. What awaits us is eternal bliss. For there is Christ and die is gain. And we, you and I, we live as this life is everything. Oh, friends, be not mistaken, it is not. We are our home, and our home is heaven. And one day we, we shall run into it with fullness of joy. May we live like it now. May we sing like it now. May we pray like it now. Give us more. He who did not spare his own son, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Say it again, my cause for purpose. So I want you to think. I don't want you to just hear what I'm saying. I want you to think. He who did not spare his own son, the Father who did not spare his son, who is the pinnacle of all things, who is, as Colossians says, that all things are held together by him. All things, he goes on to say, exist by him, and also he says they exist for him. Be reminded of it this morning. If he has given of his son, Paul is saying, who he delivered up for us all, how then shall he not freely give us all of the things? You see, the Christian is not one who lacks. The Christian is one who has an abundance. He has the forgiveness of sins. And know this, friends, that you are the best lawyer. When the accuser comes and all he comes, doesn't he? He comes thick and fast and he brings every accusation against you. You have the best advocate. And you know what his name is? His name is Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation for our sins. And if we have sinned, we have an advocate. And his name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. Why do we live like we have an advocate? Why do we live as if our sins are still against us? Why do we live as if we don't have eternal life? I shall not lack any good thing. We have a promise. Neither death nor life nor angel nor principalities or power can take us from our shepherd. Call that whatever theology position you want to call it, friends. But I call it biblical. And I say we have to live like it. I say we have to praise like it. And read out the Bible to call you to it. That's what it says. My, my shepherd, friends, he will hold me fast. 
They are destroyed. And he will, as we will go on, he will lay you in green pastures and still waters. And now they will put me in the presence of my enemies. What a glorious day. And my cup will run over. We do not like saints. Not even when all is dark. And it seems like all is lost. We do not lack. When it all seems impossible. And oh how we will be there. Everything is against us. We do not lack in those times. Oh no friends, rather this. Even in that we can have great assurance that we lack no good thing. You might be saying, how? You still might be saying, I wish I could believe this. Maybe you are. Maybe you will. Maybe you do. But again, I repeat with no apology that great verse that I've already read, Romans 8 28, it sadly is misquoted or half quoted, but can truly and should truly apply to the true fold of God. It is this we know who is the we. If you read Romans 8 carefully, the we begins at the very beginning of chapter 8. There is no condemnation to do to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the we there. That's the we there in, in, in verse 9 and 14 when it talks of those who have been given the Spirit. Those who can call themselves sons and heirs. That's the we. So we, we, the flock of God, know that all things work together for good. To who? To those. There's a two there. To those. To those who love God, to those who are called, according to what? To His purpose. You see, Paul doesn't say this, does he? All good things work together for good. He doesn't say that. He says, all things work together for good. You see, if you are this morning one of the flock, one of the sheep who have heard his voice, one who can say, I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You can say this morning that you have been born of his spirit, not of flesh, but of the spirit. If you truly are his, you can say this with great joy. And this ought to be one of the most glorious passages for you. If indeed you are his. If Christ truly is your shepherd, you can be certain that the darkest hour of your life is and has been for your good. You see, it's language that is foreign to the human mind that ought to be very true to the soul that is home. The darkest hour of your life has been and will be for your good. Believe me, saints, in all of it you will never lack. You must come to a point where that is so applied that you rejoice. In this room you shall not love. You may come to a point, you may be at that point where you cry out as the psalmist did, how long, Lord, how long? The flock of God, trust in your shepherd who supplies all of your needs. I must conclude. And I plead with you to come on. Come to Christ. Maybe that might be that you've never actually come and bowed me. I will clearly you now to bow me. One day you will bow me. And today you've got another opportunity to bow me with mercy. 
rather than the day of judgment will bow under the wrath and judgment. You will bow then. But come now, bow to the shepherd himself. But you come now, who are constantly leaning on your own understanding. Come again. Darren preached it last week. Come again, and all you have heard. Come, come again to him who is able. Stop trusting in yourself. Stop trying to forgive yourself of your own sins. And stop trying to wash yourself in your own doings and your own works. Friends, it's futile. And it leads to one thing, it's misery. Come now to be refreshed by the shepherd. Stop looking to the world to be your supply. Look to the shepherd. Be fed from him who has loved you and has shed his blood for you. That truly today you might have life and have it in moments. May the God of heaven speak this word into our very souls. Amen. Amen.